Cool. Well, okay. Uh, well, thanks for coming over. Uh, my name is Julio Cardenas. I a principal data scientist at United Healthcare. That's that's my current job. And I used to be part of uh, U of A as a faculty in the Department of Medical Imaging. And uh, I had uh, uh, great luck of meeting some of the organizers of this uh, workshop uh, in the past. Uh, and I learned a lot about, you know, like uh, reproducibility and, and science and things like that. So that was something that really, uh, really helped me with my career. Um, and what I'll share with you today is something that I've been working on uh, and using the work, and it's called generalized low rank models. And uh, I'll walk you through what I mean by that and, uh, and how this is uh, useful. And so if you have any questions or uh, um, or comment, just please uh, stop me at any point. And uh, I'm going to turn off my camera so we have better bandwidth. And I'll share my screen with you in a second. Okay. Can everybody see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Okay, so this is the uh, idea. So I'm sure many of you have heard about uh, low rank representation, so dimensional, dimensionality reduction for data. And this is a, a method or a strategy that is meant to be general and now, and now um, for all types of data. And so what I'm going to uh, share with you is first an, a, a small intro on the generalized uh, low ground models. Uh, and how they they work. And then I'm gonna apply these to a small data set of uh, data uh, related to penguins. Um, unfortunately, I cannot share with you what I've done at work, uh, but we have applied the same methodology that I'm sharing with you today to about three and a half million people uh, to do segmentation and or dimensionality reduction. So that's, it's really scalable and it's really, it's really nice. And so here's the idea. So as you, many of you know, uh, we have some challenges when we try to work with uh, data in the real world. Um, so um, the, the first one, uh, I divide them in two categories. The first one is structural, which means that uh, we usually see uh, features with large dimensionality uh, and they're categorical. For example, like zip code uh, or codes for medications or doctor codes, or things like that, or specialty codes, at least in healthcare where I work. That's that would be a high dimensional vector. For example, says would be a 50 dimensional one hot encode vector. Um, that is one problem. Um, in some instances also representing uh, um, missing values are have a meaning or not, depending on the context. Uh, then we also have mixed uh, data types, like uh, we can have continuous data along with Boolean categorical and normal. For example, here we have H, and age uh, is continuous, of course, but it has some missing values there. And we have gender, uh, which is uh, categorical and uh, diabetic that is Boolean, right? So there's at least three kinds of data in this little data set. Uh, and sometimes the large to raise large data sets are not easy to manage with some like uh, low representations. Um, and the important thing also is that we have analytical challenges. For example, let's say you want to quantify the difference between two observations, but they only differ in the categorical data. For example, let's say we have these first two uh, persons in this case, right? Um, and if you ignore the prescriptions, so you can, you can see that the only difference is that one of them lives in Arizona and the other one lives in North Carolina. So of course, I cannot just say that subtract Arizona from North Carolina in some sort of uh, non-numerical way because it doesn't make any sense. Or maybe in this case, it's possible that living in Arizona, living in North Carolina is not that different uh, given the context in which this data couldn't be collected. So it doesn't matter. Whereas in other instances, it could be quite significant. So this is an interesting challenge that I see at work and you know, trying to apply data science um, uh, regularly. The other problem that we sometimes encounter is uh, we have redundancy in the features. So those features that are, even though they could be categorical and continuous, for example, 
they sort of give the same amount of information. So we can just get rid of one of them or, uh, or substitute one with the, with the other if we don't have a complete data set. Um, so another issue is that how we input missing entries, right? So in many instances, for example, here would be the median of this age, but there should be another way that would tell us, okay, what is the more probable value here for this age? Um, so the low rank models try to uh, solve some of this or most of these issues simultaneously. Um, and this is the work of Madeline Nudell at Cornell University. And, um, and I'll share with you the, uh, the paper and everything. Um, so the idea here is the following. So let's imagine that you have uh, your data set A, right? This is your data table uh, that has all these mixed types of data. Um, and then you want to decompose this matrix into two other matrices, X and Y. Both of these matrices and Y, X and Y are numerical and full, meaning that they don't have empty uh, missing entries and all they, all they have is numbers, right? So if you were to have only numerical data on A, um, which is a particular case, you end up with that you can reconstruct a from the multiplication of f, x and y, like I'm, I'm, I'm describing here. And so what is happening here then is that we are creating two representations of A. If you assume that the, end, the rows of this column are your observations and the columns are features, so uh, then uh, you have two representations, one for the features, and uh, I'm sorry, the, the cases, the ob observations, and one for the features in, uh, in Y. And so then what you can have here is because now you have numbers on this categorical or mix of data, you can do whatever you want with this thing that is related to machine learning, right? So having numbers, it's always much easier to handle than having uh, categorical data along with other types of data or even just categorical data. So in this context, you could see uh, PCA, uh, principal component analysis as a particular case of the low rank models, right? In which the idea here is that uh, you can solve this analytically um, by a single or value decomposition, or you can use something called alternating minimization. So this is uh, sort of like the secret sauce that allows the low rank models to work. The bottom line here is that you can calculate X and Y uh, given how well this multiplication reconstructs the matrix A, right? So this is super standard um, uh, and it's just, uh, and it's, it is very common. So as you can see here, this is a least square solution. And, uh, and the idea is that the same approach, approach can be generalized to any kind of data, right? And so and this is how you would do that. So you would need uh, four things, right? So the first one is that um, you need a loss function uh, for each of the columns. Um, for example, if you have continuous data, you would apply a quadratic loss function uh, if you have Boolean data, you could apply a logistic function, uh, like in logistic regression, um, or categorical data, you can have some other sorts of uh, encoding for those, those data types. Um, and that's number one. Number two is that what this is describing is that you're only going to calculate this loss function on the observed entries. If you have a missing value and, and an IJ entry of A, you basically ignore it. Um, the only two things that you need is regularization. That means is that you are going to uh, add some penalty to these loss function uh, for X and Y. And what this does is that allows you to have some structure in your uh, data. And so it's easier to find a, a true solution to this uh, problem, right? And so, like I mentioned before, the idea is that because you have different data types, you will use different uh, loss functions. So if I, you have real data, you have all these possibilities. Um, where, for example, like you have integer counts in your data, you can use a Poisson, Poisson loss function because you know that your data it has a Poisson distribution. 
So the bottom line is that this makes it general. So this is a general framework to uh, reduce the dimensionality of data. Um, and so, and then the consequence of this is that if you choose uh, the regularization uh, and the loss function um, properly, what you end up with is some of the uh, uh, other known dimensional reduction techniques. For example, if you use a quadratic loss uh, for both X and Y and no regularization in X and Y, you end up with PCA. So PCA is a particular case of this. Um, oops, that didn't work. Um, then if you have quadratic uh, losses on X and Y, and then you have this uh, non-negative constraint regular, uh, uh, regularization in your data, you end up with non-negative matrix factorization, which is a known you know, entity. A very interesting one is that if you use quadratic losses on X and Y, um, no regularization on X, and then you tell that you want this kind of const uh, constraint, meaning that only one of the entries of each, so for each row of Y, only one of the columns can be non-zero. So this is what it means you need one sparse. So what you end up is doing K means clustering and you directly recover the X. Uh, uh, X is gonna tell you the, uh, um, I'm sorry, the, the cluster for each one of those observations. And so and then all the other cases are recoverable here. Uh, Udell, um, Madeline Udell uh, wrote a paper that is enormous, like 70 pages or something. And all this is described there. Uh, and uh, and it's, it's, it's an excellent read. So do you, does anybody have any questions until up to this point? I know it's a lot of math, but any questions? Nope, okay. Well, this is what I'm gonna do then. Then I'm gonna work with Python. So I wanna show you how to do this on these uh, Penguin's uh, data set. And the idea here is that this is easy to do and it has uh, some uh, uh, several kinds of features, right? So it's like species, uh, island. These are properties of the penguins pick, the link, the, this, what they call it, a bale, um, uh, the mass of the penguin and the sex of the penguin, right? So this is a nice case of um, um, mixed data. One of the reasons I started using this data set rather than the very famous Iris data set one is because this has mixed data types. And the other one is that Fisher has some, I think eugenic kind of like views of life. And uh, yeah, I don't want to use these data sets. So uh, uh, that's not kosher for me. So, um, so let me actually go to the number book. Um, uh, book two, two, two. So the notebook is here on the on the on the um, on the repo, but I already had it uh, working on my here. There. Can you see okay, or do I need to zoom this? It's a little bit small. Okay, let's see. Zooming would help. What about now? Yeah, I think that's better. Okay, I'm gonna deliver it more. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, I have, I'm gonna use H2O for this. And this is the, uh, this is the, what I have to do. So this is all the libraries that I need. Um, I'm gonna need to do some data cleaning. Um, and so we actually don't need this guy, but anyway. Uh, so what H2O does is that this guy runs on a, hmm, what's happening? Oh, on a little local server, and it does runs Java in the back end. Uh, but this is a Python API. Um, and uh, this, I, there's a GUI version of, uh, of uh, H2O, but this, I'm doing the programmatic. So the first thing is loading the data set, as you have here. I'm going to load it live. Um, and so you can see that here have some you know, missing entries for these guys. And uh, and have the data in different uh, orders of magnitude, right? So I had to scale it. 
So then the data has three types. The, the numerical columns that I'm describing here, this Boolean and categorical. H2O handles both uh, Boolean and categorical data for the losses the same way. But if you were doing this in Julia, you actually will handle them differently if you wanted to, which is really nice. And so, okay, cool. And then uh, now I already rescaled the data. So what I did here is just, this is a standard and, and, uh, and scalar. I'm just, I am just centering and scaling the data, right? So you can see now that the categorical data continues the same, but now this has mean zero and standard deviation again, right? So um, then the data has to be loaded into the H2O server. I don't know if you call it a server, but then that's what you do there. Oops, what happened? No way, really, are you kidding me? Oh, because I need to read. Okay, yeah. So the data is up now on this H2O frame, same shape. And H2O handles machine learning in a funny way. So you have categorical data or anything that is not numerical, you need to specifically tell it that, like in R, I think, uh, that which columns are factors. And so in this case, I'm just telling you that each of these, uh, columns are factors, right? The categorical data. And so end up with only 344 rows, which is nothing, and seven columns, right? And so this is my final, uh, is the same data than I had for, now it's in H2O, right? So now here comes the, uh, comes the catch. If you were to do this for data that for new data, you will split this into training and testing and try to check the reconstruction error or your data and so forth. I do, I've done that at work, but I'm, I'm not going to do that here because um, it's time consuming, but it's just, just to introduce you to this idea. So what I did is, uh, is I wrote a function that takes you know, the data frame and you just have to tell it what rank you want in your data, the machine reduction, all the regularization and uh, regression strength and the penalties. Um, and, and something that is very important is this singular value decomposition method. That's how it finds X and Y. If you use a randomized uh, algebra method, every time you run it, it's gonna be a little different. So I use other methods. Um, so that way I get the same result every time I run this. Um, that's an important thing. And so, I'm gonna run here. So I'm running this gram SBD method, right? Uh, and so what I'm telling you here is that I'm going to do a quadratic regularization on X and Y. This is a string of a regularization and I want four, uh, a rank of four, meaning that Y is going to have four rows. Then, uh, and this is what's happening. So it actually starts here and it has an initial guess using SVD and then, you know, keeps uh, iterating until it converges. So basically you cannot find a better solution than these for the objective function. So that's telling you that it actually converged. Um, you don't need this right now. Okay. And here's what I want to show you. Okay. So as you can see here, uh, So before I had categorical and numerical data, right? So now I have two matrices, Y and this one X that I'll show you in a minute. And so this is expanded for the one hot encoding of the data if it's needed and he has four dimensions. So really the, the Y column is like this, right? So here's the idea is that if you multiply X and Y and then process the data, you can recover all your categorical or all your data, your initial data set. And for X, you can see that you have now for each penguin, rather than entire, you know, the all the columns, you have these four columns that is a linear combination of the rows of Y. OK, 
Can you please stop me here? Am I just talking to the void or is anybody following? Okay. So this is what happened. I'm gonna tell you what I did. So this is the, you can take this Y matrix and all I'm doing is plotting the first two dimensions of this representation. And you can see here that I have different types of data, right? So these are the features. So I'm looking at the features of the, of the matrix. So you can see here that I have the species. It is in this coordinates, whatever they are, in this categorical data. And then these are the species visco. So you can tell you here that at least in these two dimensional space, being in this species, uh, in this species, it is a different thing. So that is a very, very useful thing to do. Imagine that this was a person that has diabetes positive and not diabetes. So, and this will tell you a lot about them, right? Um, whereas if, for example, for your particular data set, the diabetes and non-diabetic uh, is not different that will be close, like you have here. Meaning that the, fl the flipper length, the uh, feet length and the body mass of the penguin they're about give you about the same information. So they are exchangeable in, in this, this two-dimensional space. So also the bill length, the peak length is very similar to these other guys. And interestingly, the, the sex of the, uh, of the penguins is two. So what this is saying is that this categorical, this Boolean feature sex, it is very similar to bill length and to body mass. So I think, I recall that for these, some of these penguins, it is the, ma the males are smaller. So whatever the direction is, but they are together here, they move together size and sex of the penguin. Whereas for example, some of them have no, don't, ha don't have, that I don't have a, I have nulls for those. So the nulls are in some other space. Um, here, the, all the species, see, it is chin strap. It is very different than the species over here, right? And so, Again, what's happening is that you can see that these two species are quite different. And again, um, the gender female here is closer to being to this other build depth in millimeters um, and to being island from the dream island. So this island. So this is a very nice way of looking at your variables and see if they are different or not, right? Um, So just to uh, reiterate, what is happening here is that I have, I don't know where this loss format. Uh, these uh, two, in this case was two, uh, whatever the number of columns is by seven, right? So, but what I'm trying to do is show you here. You could have done this with the X data, right? And what I did here is just take each penguin and then plot them in two dimensions in the first two dimensions. And you can see that uh, some of the species um, are overlapped with this other species. So maybe they're mislabeled or they collected them wrong or something. Whereas all these species here, for example, they live very in, in a very different area than this other species. So this is a representation, a numerical representation of a categorical data. Um, I, when I discovered these, and um, for work, we had to do this a lot, and it was being very difficult to create manual rules and things like that. So now you can even compare people, right? You can have distances between, in this case, penguins, or between patients, or between whatever you want to represent. So this is, for me, was very important, um, very useful. So... So at the same time then, uh, because now you can have an, an, a representation of your data in numerically, I can do clustering on my, um, on my features, right? So this is telling me that there's basically three set of features. So there's like three distinct groups of features. So they kind of cluster together. It would be like saying there's like three phenotypes of penguins, right? And you can see that the features for this space are very distinct. So it's not super useful in this context, but, uh, but when you have 
a hundred on three hundred columns in your data, this becomes very important, or features uh, becomes very important to distinguish what's 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 what, right? And then at the same time, you can do the clustering on X on the penguins, right? So you can see that you have three clusters of penguins, uh, which is when you plot it, you can see that you do one, two, and three. So of course this is tractable because it's nicely, uh, you can do it manually and, uh, and the clusters are well separated. And so what's happening here is that you simply uh, are representing your data numerically. So, and again, you can uh, then lo do logistic regression on the data, right? So these are just three random features on the uh, original data set. Uh, and what I did here is just took this, this four features that I created and I'm predicting the, I think the species. I mean, this is not, this is kind of cheating, it's super easy, um, but it tells you that then now that you have this numerical representation, you can do sorts of different ways, many different things. Um, and so, What's happening is when you do the clustering, for example, like you would say that these all these penguins now have numerical representation, and this is the centroids for um and in, in two dimensions for uh k means clustering. And the way you recover the data is that you simply have the representation, this numerical representation, you rescale the you do the you know recover the the original data set. Um, and then rescale the numerical back to where uh, the original uh, scaling, and then you get your centroids. So this is super interesting. So imagine that you could say, okay, these are centroids for people who have chronic disease of whatever type versus uh, their uh, likelihood of recovering from heart from heart failure. Um, and so you can just distinguish members that way. I'm sorry, patients that way, or bi biology even. Um, I am going to stop here and ask if you have any questions. Oh, really? No one? I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I'm not sure if it's best held for later uh, or now, but um, can you go, can you talk a little bit about selecting the, the parameters and the effects of changing the parameters when you run the, the little rank estimator function? Mm -hmm. and, you know, cause there, there's a few of them you kind of went by pretty quick, but things like, uh, you know, the regularization parameters uh, and what are the effects of kind of tweaking those? Yeah, okay. Uh, let me just find it here. Let me find the, okay. Okay, let's see. Okay, can you see my PowerPoint? Can you guys see my PowerPoint? Yes. Okay. So, um, so the effect is the following. So it is basically how your data will look like. Um, I didn't do it here, but given that you have, you can reconstruct the data this way, you can say, okay, I have divided the data into training and testing and say, okay, I reconstructed the data and I'm gonna go check on my test data set. If I reconstructed all the categorical features correctly, and what is my error on the um, on the numerical features, right? And so, but the consequences of of this is that, for example, if you have this non-negative constraint, it is possible that your original data will not be able to recon be reconstructed properly. So then, you will have an easy representation of the data, where like you have a non non matrix factorization, but probably you will not get a great reconstruction of the data. 
um, on this k-means like uh, method, you get your clusters right away immediately, but you have only a few options to reconstruct the data. So at the end of the day, what you're doing is taking rows of y, multiplying it by each of the columns of x to reconstruct a. It was numerical that you have here. So there, if you don't give it enough rows to y, you you don't have enough cases to reconstruct the data. At the end of the day, all the data in A, it's a linear combination of the rows of Y. So those are the consequences. So if you are use, if you say that on only one non-negative, it would be possible that if you were allowing negative numbers on X, for example, you have a better reconstruction. Like kind of you do with non-negative matrix factorization that if your data is non-negative, it's gonna work fine. But if your data uh, doesn't, fulfill those properties is not going to reconstruct the data prop, uh, well. And so I'm actually going to, I can even play with that here. Um, let's see. Let's see, da, da, da. where's this? Da, 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 da. Okay. Okay, let me see if I can do this in the on fly. Super fast, actually. Mm -hmm. So for example, here, you can see that this is the sum of the square errors of when the rank is two. So basically Y has two rows. And I miss, I misconstructed a 50, 158 entries of the, of the data, right? Because I haven't here two. See, so that's one of the problems. Um, I'm gonna turn this into, uh, I think it's non-negative. Well, that's, I'm not sure. Yeah, it is. See now, uh, the numerical error is much larger and also is the misclassification error. So if you recall, we have two kinds of data. We have the, the, the numerical data that I'm using a quadratic error and the categorical data. So uh, that's a problem. So you could say that, oh, this reconstructs my, or looks really nice when I look into the, These are the archetypes, right? So each of the rows of your column or your data will be a linear combination of this. But um, the problem is that these might not be enough information to reconstruct all the data. So I'm gonna change the rank now to four and see what it does, even though it's not negative. So remember, so it was 319 and 1,147, see? Now I, I, uh, now I reduce the error. So the way you know you will be overfitting is to do this in a training and testing uh, sort of like uh, framework. Uh, so now my Y looks very different. It has four columns for rows. And I don't remember the keys. Okay, so this is what it's telling me. Uh, what it's telling me is that there's four different archetypes of penguin, right? There's one where uh, their species is this, the islands is this, it is male, and he has these numerical features, right? I remember this is a scale data. So this doesn't mean that the build length is zero, but it has the, the average uh, build length and the average flipper length. So these are the archetypes or sort of like the, I don't know what they call it, atoms, I think, in non-negative matrix factorization. So you reconstruct all penguins from there. That's what it works. So for example, at work, I have that one, but I have 20 uh, rows and have like 60 something columns, right? But that's, that's much better than having, you know, three and a half million rows by 50 columns, you know, how many possibilities I have there. Um, 
So this is these are those, those are the consequences, and this is how we use it to uh, to get the uh, to use the data. And so now X, so each come to now each penguin, for example, the first one is you take the first row and then multiply it by that, and then that's it. You get your first penguin. So this is basically belongs to that uh, segment. The second penguin is taking the first row, multiply it by 0.10, then take the second, the last row, multiply it by 0.4, and add them all up. And you get your data. That's 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 how it works. Well, if you um, if you look at the repo and then try to run it, uh, I'm sure it might be easier to um, to follow some of these uh, ideas. But I highly recommend that you read the paper, you read the papers, or at least try to run with the code if you think this would be useful for you. Anyway, that's all I have. Great, thank you. That was really uh, interesting. Uh, this is a, a new thing that I hadn't really delved into a lot, so I found it very useful. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.